Welcome, welcome back. My name is Marcy Elston Schaefer. I am with Indivisible Illinois, and I'm also with Ben the Ark, ben, ben the Ark Jewish Action Champaign Urbana and CU Indivisible. And I'd like to introduce um, Rose Colosino, who is um, one of the co-chairs for, for Indivisible Illinois, and she is also the um, election lead, um, plus other things. Take it away, Rose. Thank you so much, Marcy and uh, Justin, wherever you are, if you're here, that was amazing. I am so proud to say I've had the opportunity to work with Justin, and yes, it is about the young people. So good afternoon, thrilled, excited, so happy to have you all here. As Marcy said, my name is Rose Colasino, she, her, hers, and I am the co-coordinator of Indivisible Illinois and the Voters' Rights and Protection Lead. I am uh, overjoyed again to have you with us. I'm honored to introduce you to the women of words that win. This is a group that is going to train us on messaging. So incredibly crucial, especially after what we all know happened in Virginia. We see every day as we fight disinformation, how important proper communication and messaging is to our political climate. I first became aware of the work of the brilliant, and let me underscore, highlight, and underscore that again, the brilliant messaging strategist, Annette Schenker Osaria, earlier this year, which led me to the training provided by Words That Win. Let me tell you more about them and the value of what you are about to hear. Words That Win is dedicated to teaching and promoting strategic messaging to win hearts, minds, and votes. Strategic messaging is key to countering disinformation inoculating against dog whistles, building cross-racial coalition, and ultimately winning hearts, minds, and votes. I am going to tell you a little about the women that we'll be presenting to you. First, Ellie. Ellie is a former speech language pathologist who moved into advocacy elections and organizing. Melissa is a communication professional with over 20 years experience at a large nonprofit organization. I've got to say, I'm more than a little jealous about this next part. Melissa, she spent her 20s touring Europe as a singer in a rock folk pop band and is now devoted to getting progressives to sing from the same playbook. Melissa, I want to be you. Lisa is a retired palliative care nurse practitioner who has worked in oncology, neurosurgery, and home hospice. She became more politically engaged after retirement and the 2016 election. Lisa, as someone very involved in healthcare due to family illness, I appreciate your service and uh, your care for everyone. Our trainers have condensed their training to fit into the convening time frame. So I ask that you sign up for full future training in December. The link will be provided for you. Trust me, and this is something that Anat has taught us, repetition is key to learning and key to this training. Because of time constraints, there will not be a QA session after the training, but we ask that you place your questions in the chat and the trainers will get back to you. And now I turn it over to Words That Win. Hi, Melissa. Um, are you sharing your screen? Uh, I need whoever is sharing their screen to stop sharing. Oh, there it goes. Okay. Well, thank you, Rose for that introduction and this is gonna take it away. Yes, um, that was wonderful. So uh, the objective of today is that you come away understanding the fundamentals of strategic messaging, as Rose said, in order to win hearts, minds, and most importantly, votes. So I don't know if any of you share my guilty pleasure of reading advice columnists, uh, but actually, if you wanna know what Americans are really thinking about, I recommend that you do. But you'll see that they often tell the writers that you can't control what others do or say, but you can control how you respond to them. And it turns out political messaging is similar to a bad relationship. <laughs> The core principles of what we present tonight are based on the work of Ian Haney Lopez, Anat Schenker Osorio, and Heather McGee, whose websites we have linked in on this page, and you, uh, we encourage you to check them out. So too often people think good communication is speaking to what people think they can get, 
Our goal is to raise the bar on this and get them to see what's possible and to believe that we can actually achieve it, um, sort of what Heather was saying before. So people want nice things. What does that mean? Most people, and not just progressives, want nice things. But we're not talking about luxury cars or yachts, but universally desired things like clean air and water, affordable housing, nutritious food and enough of it, access to affordable health care, good schools for our kids, reliable transportation, safe neighborhoods. Who doesn't want this? But as we all know, some people have a much better chance of having these nice things than others. So although some progressive ballot initiatives have passed with large margins, we still see a distinct dislike and distrust of Democrats and governments. Well, you know, why is that? Um, in her book, The Some of Us, Heather McGee explains how before the Civil Rights Act, white Americans welcomed government help in growing the middle class. You know, the GI Bill, VA loans, public schools, Social Security, you know, uh, all of these things that we kind of take for granted now. But after the Civil Rights Act was passed, when Black people started to benefit from these uh, public benefits also, suddenly white Americans started seeing the U.S. as full of undeserving others, people who didn't work for this. Um, and this was code for color, Blacks. Some white communities went so far as to drain their public pools and fill them with cement rather than share them with non-whites. So the zero-sum mindset has been around for quite a while, and it's intended to keep the wealthy in power while the rest of us compete with each other for scraps. It also somewhat explains why certain groups seem to vote against their self-interest. Ms. McGee argues that this doesn't have to be, and by coming together across our differences, we can all have nice things. So I'm hearing the booing, but um, Reagan's quote, the nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government, I'm here to help, was kind of the nail in the coffin in creating distrust in government. You know, remember, uh, and I think it was Ezra who referred to this, the primary organizing principle of the Republican Party is that a minority of people should be in charge of the majority of people. And this is not a bug, it's a feature. So dog whistles, what are they? Well, for over 50 years, the opposition has used dog whistle politics to divide us. Dog whistles are coded language that use seemingly innocuous words that some people can hear and tend to provoke an emotional reaction in the intended audience. They use language that on the surface appears, you know, somewhat innocuous, normal to the majority, but communicates very specific things to its target audiences. They're generally used to convey messages on issues likely to provoke controversy, but they give the speaker some plausible deniability. Accusations of dog whistling are by their very nature, hard to prove, and they're often false. So Ian Haney Lopez identified how racism is used, as, as used strategically as a weapon of the rich against all of us. And his Race Class Academy, which we have linked on this page um, and in our resources at the end, goes into a lot more detail. And if you have the time, it's really well worth watching. It's a very big topic and um, we can't really cover it all in one slide, but uh, you, you, you'll get a lot out of listening to the master speaker himself. So as we on the left work toward building a multiracial democracy that will serve all of us, Republicans are doubling down on their nasty playbook using racial scapegoating, dog whistles, and divisive rhetoric to mischaracterize us and try to paint us into corners. And they can be pretty good at this. But research shows that not talking about race and class does not end the conversation. It just means the only voices that are gonna be heard are the right wing name callers. So messaging that leans into and acknowledges our differences, including race, outperforms economic only statements and rebutting conservative talking points. And Allie. So let's talk about our audience. Uh, how many of you are sports fans? And how many don't care about sports at all? And maybe some might care if your home team makes it into the Super Bowl or, or the World Series. Politics is the same way. Some of us are deeply entrenched. We follow the stats, the players, and all of the details. We're activists, but we are not like everyone else. When we're talking about messaging, we have to know the audience, the base, the persuadable voters, and the opposition. 
As activists, we're deeply engaged, we take action, and we rally others to do the same. The base shares our values, the opposition holds opposing views, and then we have voters in the middle um, that are in the middle, 50% of voters. They are often referred to as moderates, but as Ian Haney Lopez points out in his article linked in this slide, these voters do not hold nuanced centrist views. Rather, they are conflicted. These voters bounce between progressive and reactionary views of the world. They may gravitate to whatever's thrown their way. They hear a pitch and they think, that's a good idea. And then they hear the opposite and they think, that's a good idea. We call these conflicted voters the good point people. Our job is to sell our agenda. We need to make bold statements that take a stand and mean something to see our, to see our agenda. Commercial brands spend about 70% of their marketing budget on their super users or their influencers. This is our base. We need to sell our message to our base so that they will be the messengers and spread our words well beyond our bubbles and inspire persuadables to join in. Repetition and amplification of strategic, coordinated, disciplined messaging is loud, powerful, and it goes a long way. As for the opposition, those who do not share our values, we are not going to win them over, so we're not going to waste our time trying to. So this is what we're up against and why we need to be the loudest voice in the room, which means repeating and coordinating our messaging. And we need to communicate that we are stronger together. So in our messaging, a quick recap. We need to leverage our differences to build a cross-racial, cross-class coalition so that we stand united, fighting for what we want, need, and deserve, knowing that the other side is trying to divide us so they can increase their wealth and power. We need to win over the conflicted voters, also known as the good point people, and we need to speak up and be the loudest voice because if we remain silent, the other side will fill the vacuum with their dog whistles and rhetoric. And back to Melissa. Thank you. Um, so just to remember, we are talking about, or we want to be talking about that big, beautiful tomorrow that we want and deserve. So we're going to go through our dozen do's and don'ts. Uh, these slides will show you kind of some best messaging practices and some traps to avoid. So number one, when we use our opposition's words, we're allowing them to control the narrative. And if you aren't sure if you're using their story, just look at the words. If your words are the same, you're most likely in their frame. Number two, uh, what you negate, you bring to top of mind. So often we think that um, we can just say no and that will be it. But the problem is, is our brains, they don't wait the small words like the no and the stop and the don't and the can't, as heavy as they're going to be waiting the noun. See, our parents are not criminals, which they walk away with that. Or Antifa is not a terrorist organization. So we really want to shift the narrative to our terms. Okay, anybody remember the honey badger uh, video a couple years? So this is data don't care about your feelings. Um, Numbers and data are great to have. And we talk about having your inside voice and your outside voice. Strategic messaging is your outside voice. It's what you're selling. Think of a sales pitch to the world. So you don't go out with your numbers and figures and data, but you certainly need to have those in your inner discussion. Why don't you take that data out in the public? Well, it's not personal or accessible. People don't really connect to that data doesn't really tap into the your your feelings as activists it might but remember we're talking about the base this is a really big one if there's one thing you can walk away with today is not to amplify this opposition on social media sharing um, this only encourages the social media platforms to uh, raise up that content, as we've seen with the Facebook papers, Engage, anger is engagement. So we ask, you know, tell you, do not share, quote, tweet, 
light from the opposition, not even to refute or to make fun of. The right thing, right wing has figured out this outrage machine, and we too often play into their hands and only amplify that. Also, you could find out that you're elevating virtual unknowns to startup. So sharing um, is something that is just big no no. Let's not do that. Remember that your imagery is also a way of messaging, and we want to be mindful not to show. Of imaging that can that can um, backfire. We try to call this the avoiding the harms and horror imagery. So unintended consequences with images like this only sadly reinforces that some people that these people belong in cages. So we always want to be showing in the positive light, exposing the con. Yes. We are up against the authoritarian wannabe government, but we want to be careful of not giving them, of giving them too much power because really they are weak. They are incompetent. They are obstructionist. They are clinging to the past. And many, many are just straight up grifters. So we want to be framing that, call them out as the whiny sore losers that resort to cheating because they cannot win legitimately. Or the GOP, who all they have are dog whistles because they have no policies. Number seven, it is time that progressives and the left will reclaim freedom. And it's wonderful to hear the Freedom to Vote Act after a one year, almost exactly a year, we calling for the freedom to vote. It made its way up to Congress and they've renamed that act the Freedom to Vote Act. Other great words that we should be leaning into, family, fairness, and talking about our future. Number eight, social pressure works. People like to do the thing they think that people like to do. So your messaging that encourages everybody else is doing this, much easier to get behind. Think about high school, maybe even middle school. So messages like, we're turning out record numbers to vote, or your friends and neighbors are joining, will you? Go a long way. <sighs> so on the left is a message from a very wonderful senator about the Jobs Infrastructure and Jobs Act. Does that inspire you? 8.9 billion for roads and highways. Again, not activists, but as a base or just seeing this, these numbers, while they might make sense to us, think about it this way. In Minnesota, kids can now get reliable internet. And that's a lot more kids able to do their homework at home instead of sitting in the parking lot. That is the message we want to be selling. We, we lead with Price. First of all, it's just a lot of numbers, and it gives our, op our opposition, um, not even the opposition, even the moderate Dems, an ability to, to get stuck into that big spending argument. We want to be talking about the outcomes. You're leading with a price or a number, you, you, you're, you're from behind. Think about Apple. Do they lead with the price of their new iPhone? No. Let me lead with the impact. Number 10, avoid the media's narrative. I saw in the chat earlier, the media loves the Dems in disarray and they love you know, Dems are divided. We don't need to play into that. We again, yes, we do have conflicts, but every single member who is supporting these bills are Democrats. And so we want to be talking about that instead of pointing the fingers. Embracing the division we see now is the same we've always seen between the rich and the rest of us. Talk about our wins. Winning creates more winnings and then it's more winning. Very simple. We should be celebrating our, our wins. And I loved hearing Ezra who came in and just talked about all the great things we are doing. And of course we have more to go, 
but we want to really be celebrating our wins, even if it's a partial victory. Brag about what we've accomplished and keep pushing for more in the future. So just as a you know, little recap of some of our wins, and to remember, we are the only nation in the world that has beat back a wannabe authoritarian at the ballot box. We should be very proud of that. All the other things, the two Georgia seats, the American Rescue Plan that helped people pull through and pull by pulling together. At this point, we have 80% of adults that have been had at least one dose of the vaccine. We want to focus on those positives and use the wins as momentum to keep going. And the last, we need to be talking about what we are for. Tell people what we're fighting for and how it's going to benefit them. We galvanize our base with a values forward, people-centric messaging. And that leads with what we stand for and calls out the opposition and their motivation. There is a lot of research that shows that our ideas are very, very popular. So we should never shy about talking about them. Lisa? Oh, research shows us that not only do words matter, but so does the order of the words, how people hear them. So we call this the values, villain, vision, or, or the three B sandwich. What we want to do is what you want to do is lead with shared people-centered values. Next, you want to explain why we don't have the nice things and how villains use our differences to keep us divided. These are person-made problems and they need to be solved by people as well. And last, we end up with a vision, which is the nice things that we can have if we work together. So why do we leave with shared values? Well, think about, you know, how many progressive messages you've listened to that start with lots of problems, uh, especially with lots of statistics and problems. You know, people have tons of problems these days, and they're probably not that interested in hearing yours. So, you know, think about if you've ever been at a party and you're stuck next to somebody who starts telling you about all their problems or how terrible everything is, you don't want to stay there and keep talking to them. You start scanning the room and seeing if there's somebody who will rescue you. So we lead with the shared values because most of us do want similar things and it establishes a we. It also keeps the listener willing to continue listening and that's very important in messaging. A shared value names race explicitly to counter racist dog whistles by using the op that are used by the opposition. But this can be done in several ways, and we give you a few examples here. You know, no matter our zip code, whether you're black, white, or brown, no matter our skin color, you know, or most simply, simply most of us, no matter what we look like or where we come from. But we do want to make it clear that we're talking about including everybody. So choices reflect values. The current New York City skyline on the left is very different than what it was when I moved there in 1976. It's even different from when I left five years ago. But uh, having done visiting nursing uh, for over um, a 20 year nursing career uh, off and on, I can tell you that the pictures on the right uh, are still quite common in many neighborhoods in even a city as wealthy as New York. So what is going on here? We can somehow manage to build these ginormous buildings, but we can't uh, build and maintain and create affordable housing for everybody. Uh, th this doesn't seem to make sense. But it does, if you think about for over 50 years, the GOP has been claiming to be the fiscally prudent party, giving huge tax cuts to the wealthy and large corporations while promoting the scarcity myth, the myth that America just doesn't have the money it needs to take care of people. You know, there, there's, we just don't have it. The U.S. is an incredibly wealthy country. It still is. But as you are all aware, the wealth is increasingly con concentrated in the hands of a small percentage of the population. And contrary to Reagan's voodoo economics, it does not trickle down. So we need to communicate frequently, clearly, and loudly that our policies and lack of a social safety net reflect very conscious choices that have been made by politicians, not a lack of resources. Next, we come to the villain part. And I, I will say people tend to struggle with this a bit. Um, Democrats try to be nice, but we don't have to be that nice. 
Um, naming the villain ascribes motivation and explains why we don't have nice things and how the right uses our differences to divide us. Our enemy is not each other, even though they try to pit us against each other, but it's those who violate our values. So naming the villain describes who is doing this, you know, some lawmakers, politicians, corporations, what they're doing, prioritizing profits, their power over people, how they're doing it by dividing us, and why they do it to maintain their power and increase their wealth. Uh, this is not name calling, but it points out when certain groups, corporations, wealthy individuals, PACs, some politicians, take your pick, take specific actions that hurt people. We can't assume the average person understands why this is happening. So the best way to fight disinformation is to describe the man-made origins, effects, and solutions to inequality. We want to expose the con. We're all getting screwed is a lot more powerful than finger wagging or saying, you know, here's the facts, or you shouldn't believe that. Um, people do understand uh, when they're getting conned. Uh, one caveat is uh, we want you to avoid saying the government or all politicians. Uh, that's two things. Uh, people already have a huge distrusting government, which has been fomented for decades by the right. So we don't want to give them a reason to have more. Government can do good things. We also want to say it's a handful, a few, some, so it's less overwhelming and to avoid the exceptions to the rule trap. Uh, we are often asked if it's okay to name names, you know, specific villains, and this is a judgment call that you will have to make, uh, whether you want to name somebody specific like Senate Republicans, BP Petroleum, the Sackler family, the Koch brothers, there's so many, uh, I could go on for all, all afternoon, uh, versus more general villain, villains like we do here in our examples, certain politicians, huge corporations, the wealthiest 1%. Uh, this is going to depend on your organization, the issue, the platform, and your audience. So there's no, not a hard and fast rule against doing it, but you just need to think about what you're doing and who you're trying to reach. And Allie. Um, when we talk about the villain, we need to use the active voice, not the passive voice. These two slides show the difference between the passive voice and the active voice. Many people lost their homes. Our rivers and streams were polluted, but that's only telling part of the story. Corporate lenders are forcing people out of their homes and some politicians are letting corporations pollute our waterways. Things don't just happen. These are conscious choices that people make. The active voice pulls back the curtain so that we can see that there are real people or villains making these choices and causing harms. As activists, we tend to focus on the victims because we're compassionate and we're empathetic, but we need to shift our attention to the villains who are creating the problems and the harms. The example of the passive voice here, school budgets were cut, leaves a lot to the imagination. Who, how, and why were school budgets cut? The passive voice forces the listener to make assumptions, fill in the blanks, and often blames the victim about why things happened as if, they happen naturally, or people made bad decisions, or they did something that landed them in this situation. The passive voice also hides the structural racism and its impact. Obviously, systemic structural racism profoundly hurts people of color, but as a whole, structural racism works against all of us. And as referenced earlier, Heather McGee's book, The Some of Us, delves into this. In contrast to the passive voice, the active voice, example here, some lawmakers consistently cut funding to our schools, especially those in poor communities, exposes the con, calls out the villain, the action, and the resulting harm. The active voice makes it clear that the actors caused the problem with intent, it holds the actors accountable, and it signals that a problem that is person-made can be person-fixed. So let's take a moment and look at a couple of examples. So in this case about fair economy, here are a couple of examples. And if you could write the, which one is the active voice in the chat, A or B, active voice. Right, A is the active voice. Some politicians pass laws that favor the rich. In the second example, um, 
We don't know who, who's doing it. Some workers are not paid fairly, but why or who or how? Again, that's the passive voice leaves it up to the imagination. A, active voice, we're calling out the, the villains. Next one, voting. In the chat, if you would identify which one is the active voice. New voting laws that restrict access to voting, especially in certain areas were passed, or a handful of politicians wanna put up bar barriers to make it harder to vote, especially for black and brown voters and new Americans. Right, B is the active voice. Clearly we identify the, the villains, a handful of politicians where the other leaves it to our imagination, fill in the blank, make assumptions. And now back to Melissa. Yeah, so we want to end our freebie sandwich and with an aspirational solution. So we really want to be talking about the world that we seek to live in. Um, and these solutions are really about creating something good and not just reducing the bad. Again, we need to really get rid of that the bad girls can't be choosers mentality. We have enough resources in this country for all of us, all of our children have exceptional schools for a lot of the things that Democrats want to do. So let's be aspirational, let's be bold and talk about that. How do we do that? By providing our vision. So with this signal that what happens when we come together, so it's less about a specific policy or a politician, and it's really focused on us. Voters are the center and the heroes of this story. You know, when we take care of each other, we make sure that we all have access to affordable health care, no exception. Or by joining together and electing leaders like so-and-so, we can create a safe, healthy community for everyone. It's also important to um, use the no exceptions. Unfortunately, one of the dog whistles um, is everyone is not everyone. So we wanna make sure that we make a, there, that there are times where we really have to emphasize that. There's just no ex exception. So imagine, and I know it's after lunch and it's probably that time that you are imagining a, you're just craving a chewy chocolate brownie. And then somebody says, oh, here's some melted butter and here's some super fine sugar and a couple of eggs and how about some bittersweet chocolate with that? Mmm, are your cravings satisfied? Yeah, I don't think so. That's what often, too often, the left does. We call that the recipe. Instead, this is what people want. They want to be able to sink their teeth into something that is tangible, that they can connect to. We call this the brownie. Your message, again, the inside voice, you have to have that policy that when you go out to the world, you don't sell recipe, individual ingredients, you sell your brownie. You talk about how it's going to make your life better in those human terms. So let's give you a couple um, examples of these yummy outcomes. What makes a brownie? Paid family leave. Sure, right? That's gonna be a brownie because we all know what that means. Does it? Yes, you have the money, but really, what does that mean? What do you get from that paid plan? You get to be there the first time your baby smiles or you get to be able to care for a loved one when they need it most. That is the brownie and the outcome of the policy of paid family leave. The Green New Deal, great. Yeah, we all know what that means, right? Well, besides being totally weaponized by the right, we also, it means a little bit something uh, for different people. But when we talk about locally generated clean energy, good paying green energy jobs, 
um, you know, climate, taking care of our environment. That's more of, of the brown. The Green New Deal is a policy. The brownie is a, a bright future. So when marriage equality was uh, trying to be enacted, there was a lot of push for uh, gay equality and gay rights. But what really got people to be able to get their heads around and, and, and just understand the concept is that love is love. And how can you argue with that? That is the thing that we can all connect with and understand with. So let's again, check in with the brownies. And I'm really sorry if you guys are getting hungry. There might be a break after this. You can go run and get a little uh, sweet something. Okay. Which one is the brownie? Right. Being paid a wage that covers your basic expenses and leaves you with enough money to buy your kids ice cream at the end of the month. Because when you start getting stuck into that argument of $15 minimum wage, well, then now somebody else wants $12 minimum wage. Well, in California, they really think it's $20 minimum wage. The whole point is you need to be able to be paid a fair living wage that allows you to cover your expenses and buy your kids an ice cream. That's the brown. Okay, and healthcare. Again, we get a lot of stuck on the policies, Medicare for all, for all, or maybe a public option. In the end, they're both trying to achieve the same thing, which is seeing your trusted family doctor without worrying about your copay. Lisa. Yes. So let me get back. Um, this is almost like learning new, a new language. Um, it takes a lot of practice and we did find it very helpful to work as a team, particularly as we were just getting started. It's so easy to fall into the traps that we described in the do's and don'ts, especially repeating the right wing messaging. And, you know, remember, we want to drown out the right wing noise, reframe the narrative on our own terms and tell people what we're for. So we're going to look at a couple of examples. Uh, the, well, one example that needs some work and one good example. So this next one, um, you know, this is uh, quite a word salad. <laughs> um, it's very common. You'll see it on a lot of candidate websites. And in the next slide, we're going to break it down. Why don't you skip ahead to the next slide because it's actually the same. Um, so this is the exact language that you saw before. And we've broken it down so that you see what this candidate was doing. Um, while there are a couple of really good solutions in here, you know, leads with uh, two problems, does have one good positive statement, but then another problem. The solution is sort of buried in the middle there. And then there's another problem. And finally, there is a solution. So it's the first problem would be, would anybody even read through the entire statement? And, you know, drug pricing is really a separate issue than, than just healthcare and access to it. So it, it's kind of a muddled mess. And, you know, I'm not sure that his message got across. So here's our rewriting of it. Um, keep in mind that uh, this is uh, the next slide, Melissa. Th this is not the absolute most perfect uh, only right answer, but it's one version. So you see how we lead with a shared value, which in, you know names race and includes everyone. Uh, then we talk about why some people don't have this nice thing that we call healthcare. Um, and then we end up with the vision. And the candidate did have a good vision and um, sort of uh, throws a little brownie there too. So, you know, most importantly is you don't want to repeat the opposition messaging and you want to stick to the basics of the three, the values, villain and vision uh, framework. Here's another example from a candidate that actually did a pretty good job. And as you can see, um, 
they name, you know, they, people who work for a living ought to earn a living, a shared value, no matter their race or zip code. But today, a powerful few exploit workers and keep wages down while getting rich off of what we create, although they're having more trouble doing that, given the um, people don't, aren't uh, willing to put up with that and employers are having trouble finding employees. And by electing leaders like candidate X, we can achieve a livable wage so that everybody can be paid enough to provide for their families and give their children a bright future. So that sort of ends on that vision note and, and you know, something of a brownie too. Uh, Ali? An essential part of the message is the messenger. Messengers matter. Each of you is a trusted messenger. Your ability to speak out coupled with the relationships built on trust and credibility give you superpowers to influence others. Use your power to advocate, educate, and mobilize people to action. And remember, if you aren't stepping up and speaking out, someone else on the other side is. So be the louder voice. Likewise, build your network of trusted messengers so that people share your message and push it out to an even larger audience, creating a ripple effect so that your message travels well beyond your circle. Also, be mindful of the messenger and your intended audience. Communities are rich in culture, languages, and tradition. Messengers need to not only be credible, but also culturally competent and sensitive. You may not be the best messenger for every audience, and that's okay. Um, you know, for example, messengers that appeal to my kids are not going to appeal to me and vice versa. So work with allies and partners and find messengers who will resonate with the people that you want to reach. Repetition is persuasion. The more you hear a message, the more desirable it becomes. Think Obama's Yes We Can or Dunkin' Donuts, America Runs on Dunkin'. As Anat Shankar Osorio says, if you aren't sick of your own message, then you haven't said it enough. Here are some messaging campaigns that did this. When the votes were challenged in 2020, there was a coordinated campaign to demand count every vote. Senators Warnock and Ossoff prevailed in their races against Republicans who perfected the art of dog whistling, but they won their races using tightly coordinated messaging focused on healthcare, jobs, and justice. And now we are rallying around the phrase, build back better to promote Biden's agenda. You can hear more success stories on Annette, on Annette, on Annette Schenker Osorio's podcast, Words to Win By. And back to Melissa. Okay, so we are coming towards the end. We're going to do a little recap of your winning messages. Always lead with your shared values. Remember, people have 99 problems. They don't want to hear yours. We want to connect to that personal lived experience. Um, you know, that what's in it for me? How does this connect? That's a little bit of that brownie. It's really important that we are ascribing blame and harm and that we're using that active voice. So all stories have a villain. We have a villain and we use the active voice to describe that. We want to lean into family, fairness, freedom, and the future. We want to provide a vision and be aspirational. And for God's sake, <laughs> we need to be talking about what we are for and what we plan to deliver. So this is where we were a year ago. And how did we get there? Again, the only country who is uh, beat back in a, a wannabe authoritarian government at the ballot box. We did this, and this goes back to Ezra's and uh, Heather's brilliant, inspiring conversations, is we did it by organizing. We knocked doors, we build strong foundations, and we were loud. And guess what? We did it. And that means we can do it again. We just take what we're learning from today, and we march forward. The biggest threats to um, our democracy, basically, quite frankly, is complacency and then cynicism. And we have, we, we know that we're not gonna do that because you're all here on this call. The other thing from our point is controlling our narrative. 
again, sticking relentlessly to leading always with people center, centered shared values and always calling out our villains. There's a lot of noise out there to distract us. Let's stay laser focused, project confidence, resilient, resilience, tell our story. And when we do that, we can do anything. Thank you very much. I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Lisa. This is the training that will help us win. I say that as someone that's been trained in marketing and has worked in marketing, and I am so grateful for you. I hope that uh, we become long-term partners, and this is just the start. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us. You guys are amazing. Thank you.